So I'm really excited to introduce Rafe Sagarin, a marine biologist, to teach us just a little bit about how that comparison works. Please welcome Rafe to the stage. All right. It is so great to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I put up my email up here because I am not a recluse like the old J.D. Salinger. Uh, I am happy to continue this conversation at any point into the future, and I hope I do leave you with some questions and some challenges uh, about where we're going with this idea. And I want to at least try to answer the first question that's probably on your mind, which is, why is a marine biologist who lives in the desert <laughs> talking to us about management, leadership, emergency response, terrorism, peace building, teaching? And so I hope to get at that um, in a very personal way at the beginning of this talk. Um, and it has to do with this observation that uh, if you look at life itself, that 3.5 billion years of life, or science as a practice, or the life of a scientist, it's what I call a recursive process of observation and adaptation. A recursive process is something you can map out mathematically or you can map out in the shell of this nautilus, is something that grows based on its past experience. It starts with a seed and it grows, but it has to reference its past to move forward. And it moves forward because it observes a change and responds to that change. And for most life scientists, especially marine biologists, that seed of that recursive process that started our whole spiraling pathway has to do with this process of observation that Maria was talking about this morning. This intense observation, and that process for me, as with many scientists, started way back when. This is me as a little boy on the seashore. This photo was actually taken on the very day of my first memory as a human being. So my first conscious sense of being a human had to do with my experiences on the seashore, observing the life and the tides. And so it's not surprising that my professional career also drew me uh, to the seashore and to be uh, a marine biologist here on the coast uh, of California in Monterey. But there's another aspect of observation, which is what you do with those observations and how you adapt to the observations you make. Now, adaptation is an interesting process. It's a push-pull process. It's about leaving your comfort zone or maybe being forced from your comfort zone. So if you think about these early amphibians, they are coming out of seas that are filled with all sorts of crazy, nasty predators like saber-toothed salmon and other things that you wouldn't want to mess with. But they're also finding abundant opportunities on land where there's very few competitors to deal with. Now, my comfort zone had always been those tide pools in Monterey. They're a beautiful place, and I was perfectly happy being there. But I found myself shortly after 9-11 far outside my comfort zone in a place called Washington, D.C., where I worked as a science advisor uh, to then Congresswoman Hilda Solis. Later, she became our labor secretary, but she was just starting then. Her main interests uh, coming from East L.A. were labor issues and environmental issues. And I thought, great, I can go up there. I'm an environmental scientist. I can help her with those environmental issues. But it turns out that in that Congress, which is very much like our current Congress, there was very little interest at all in environmental issues in any way. So I found myself way outside of my comfort zone. There's no tide pools around in Washington, DC. There's the tidal basin, but that doesn't really count. Um, and yet, I had one skill I could contribute to what was going on, which was my skills as an observer of complex systems. And what I observed in that year following 9-11 in DC was what I call an ecology of fear. Fear was what was controlling everything we were doing. And everywhere, you saw new manifestations of this. So every morning, New Jersey barriers would pop up like mushrooms in a ring around every monument, new metal detectors and new guards everywhere. But what struck me very quickly was how different this ecology was from the tide pools that I was so used to. Because 
Those tide pools that have now gone to for thousands and thousands of hours are different every single time you go there. There's something new, some change, and yet these security systems came up and they didn't change. And the aha moment for me was one morning I was walking into the house office building and I was fumbling to get my keys out of my pocket to put them on the metal detector belt. And this young staffer turned to me and said, oh, don't bother taking your keys out of your pocket. Just put your hand over your keys and you can walk right through the metal detector. And I thought, oh my God, wait a second. This woman wants to save 20 seconds in the morning and she's figured out how to adapt to this security system. What would a terrorist do? And so from that point on, I started thinking about adaptable systems and how to be adaptable. And here's the thing that I love about being a biologist. No matter what you study in biology and how hard you study it, you only have expertise in this tiny, tiny, tiny bit of the natural world. So I knew if I was going to understand adaptability, which drives all biological systems, I was going to have to bring in a lot of people from all over the realms of life sciences to understand adaptability. And if I knew almost nothing about adaptability and I was a biologist, I knew I knew even less about security. So I also brought in any kind of security experts. And I brought them all together in a series of meetings of still running where I bring the most creative minds together from these very different fields and I ask a simple question. What can we learn from nature about how to adapt to security challenge? This is where I started because 9-11 was still fresh on our mind. We've since gone on to ask nature about all sorts of challenging questions. But these are the kind of people I've been working with. Hairy, unkempt marine biologists and upright police chiefs and fire chiefs and soldiers and spies put them all together in a room, and amazing things come out. And what we learn very quickly on is that we can look at nature and all this incredible diversity and find powerful lessons for how we conduct security in society. And there's a few reasons why biology works in this way. The first is that biology trumps politics. Here's my hero. I have a marine biologist hero, not surprisingly. His name's Ed Ricketts. You will know him if you like John Steinbeck at all. He was best friend of John Steinbeck, and Steinbeck featured him in many of his books. He's Doc in Cannery Row, and he's in six or seven other Steinbeck novels. But he was a real person. He worked with Steinbeck. He inspired Joseph Campbell, the mythologist, Henry Miller, the author, John Cage, the musician. They all gravitated around Ed's little lab right there on Cannery Row in Monterey. And they'd have long, three-day-long parties using alcohol they distilled from some of Ed's specimen alcohol and these disgusting drinks and uh, all kinds of people, students and prostitutes and bums and scholars would come to this lab and listen to Ed. And he talked about music and poetry and science. And he was of an era when there was no separation between ecologists and sociologists. They believed it was one and the same and that you could learn from nature. And what Ed said was that Studying animal communities has this advantage. They are what they are. They cannot complicate the picture with worded idealisms, saying one thing and being another. And so many of our discussions get twisted and thrown off track by these worded idealisms. That's number one. Number two, biology is about living with risk. So I say, the world's full of risk, but you don't see a fish trying to turn a shark into a vegetarian. The fish will do everything in its power to avoid getting eaten by the shark. It may even form a partnership with the shark. But there's nothing in its little fishy brain that says, well, I escaped that shark and now I'm done with predation. Organisms in nature implicitly understand that they live in a risky world. Too often, we think we can get rid of risk in the world. And we try to eliminate it. We declare a war on terrorism a war on drugs. In my own field, we declare a war on invasive species, as if we can ever get rid of these risks. Rather, organisms live with risk, and I'll try to convince you that living with risk isn't a passive thing, it's not giving up, it's a very active process of adaptation. Third, and most important, biology is an enormous sample size. If you have a complex problem, and you want to figure out how to solve it, 
go to the largest database you can and look at those stories. All of nature faces exactly the same problem that all of us face, which is that the world is totally unpredictable and it's full of risk. And yet somehow, nature has been not only surviving, but thriving for three and a half billion years. That's a great source of information to look at. So what does it tell us, this huge database? First, there's a few little rules about how you have to operate in this space. And they can be a little mind-bending at first because natural organisms don't plan, they don't predict, and they don't try to be perfect. Exhibit A in my claim that natural organisms aren't planned is this bizarre looking fish, the mola mola. If I had asked all of you to close your eyes and plan for me a fish, give me your plans of a fish, not one of you would have come up with a fish that looks like that thing. It is a ridiculous looking fish. And yet, it's one of the most successful fishes on Earth. It's the largest bony fish. It has survived and thrived by finding a problem it can solve and solving it. Organisms also aren't really able to predict the future beyond simple kinds of predictable cycles like day-night cycles and lunar cycles, but the really hard stuff they're not able to predict, and they don't waste a lot of energy trying to do so. People said, oh, those uh, elephants and animals around Asia, they predicted that huge Boxing Day tsunami because they were all acting strange before it. They weren't predicting it. They were just much, much better observers of change in the world. And they sensed the changes being brought by the tsunami way before we did. Finally, there is no perfection in nature. We're often led to believe that biology is about survival of the fittest. It is not at all about survival of the fittest. It's about survival of the good enough to reproduce yourself. That's all you have to do. <laughs> That's it. We had Shark Week on Discovery Channel a few weeks ago, and you always hear during Shark Week, the great white shark, nature's perfect predator. And I always say, give me a break. It would be so much better if it had laser beam eyes. The point is, there's no way to measure perfection in nature. There's just solving problems and being good enough to do it. Now, this is challenging because we spend a lot of our time in planning exercises and making predictive models and going for perfection, giving 110%. So we have to shift our mind to think, all these organisms have thrived with these constraints that we hold as exactly how we need to move into the future. So how do we get there without being able to plan and predict and giving up this notion of trying to be perfect? And isn't that just copping out? No, it's a very active process, which is the process of being adaptable. And that's what I'm gonna talk about. Because nature tells us exactly what you have to do to adapt, and it also tells us how you do each of those things. So if you think of some big thing, big change that's gonna happen in your world and really disrupt things, in your business, in your classroom, in your family, to adapt to that thing, you need to do these things. You need to observe very closely what's happening. Once you observe the change, you need to respond to it as quick as possible. You need to often communicate about your response to your friends and sometimes to your adversaries. And every organism runs into the limits of its ability to adapt, at which point you have to expand your abilities to adapt. And when you've done that successfully, you need to iterate or reproduce your successes. There's an analog for every one of those processes in nature, which I'm gonna talk about. The first idea comes from a remarkable observer of the natural world who was one member of some of those early working groups I put together. His name is Gary Vermeer. He is a naturalist in the capital sense of the word. He knows everything about the natural world. He can identify any kind of species of snail, clam, crab, fossil from any era that you put in his hands and you've got to put it in his hands because he's been blind since he was three years old. So this amazing observer of the world 
gives us a lesson that observation, that kind of Sherlock Holmes type observation, doesn't just happen through your eyes. It happens through all your senses. And we underutilize a lot of our senses. But Vermeer doesn't use this observational sense just to catalog species. He's looked at the whole history of life and tried to figure out patterns in what species and what types of organisms are most successful. And the thing that he finds is that the most successful organisms have some decentralized way of sensing change in the world. And some examples help explain this. My favorite animal, the octopus. It's remarkably like you and I in the sense that octopuses have beautiful, wonderful brains. Their central controller is top notch. If they lived more than a couple years, they would have taken over the world by now. Fortunately, they have a short lifespan. But they're brilliant. But when an octopus needs to camouflage itself very fast, it doesn't have its amazing central brain start shouting orders and saying, arm one, you gotta turn purple, arm two, you gotta turn red, arm three, do you know what fuchsia is? Because you've gotta kinda turn a fuchsia thing here, you can see right away that's too slow and it's not effective. It doesn't give you a beautiful match like an octopus has. What it does rather is it has millions of skin cells decentralized, spread all over its body and each one of them is looking at the change in its world and responding to it so that the octopus as a whole becomes camouflage. The skin cells are still part of the octopus, they still serve the octopus, they're not anarchists, but <laughs> they observe and respond on their own, just like our immune system. It's a bunch of cells running around our body, responding to invading pathogens without any conference calls up and down to our brain. We tend to do the opposite. We tend to centralize when we feel fear. Our very first response to 9-11 was to create the Department of Homeland Security, a massive centralized bureaucracy. Very first test of the security system after 9-11, Hurricane Katrina. Very first question of Hurricane Katrina, where is FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency? Well, if you want to find a federal agency, you've got to look at the org chart. And there's FEMA locked away in this top-down organization, and it's no wonder it couldn't respond up and down the chain of command. And I always get a good laugh, especially when I talk to Department of Homeland Security people about this stuff, chuckle over their stupid org chart, and after a few years of doing this, I started to turn the lens on myself as a university professor, and I realized, oh my god, my classes at the university, I run them just like the Department of Homeland Security. If I'm the professor in that top red box, I get information that I choose out of this whole massive spectrum of information out there, and I say, this is the information you need, students, you blue boxes lined up there under the classroom, and I funnel it through the classroom and expect them to learn, and I wonder why, even though I'm a dynamic lecturer, that I have so many students who are just sitting there texting under their desks and drooling on the desk, and uh, <laughs> we'll get back to how I dealt with this problem. Secondly, nature uses redundancy to solve many types of problems. So it's great if you observe the problem, you've got to be able to respond to the problem. And nature uses both simple redundancy, which is just repeating units, like the repeating walking legs of a centipede. But if you really want to fire it up, you use what Gary Vermey calls creative redundancy, which is when you take all those repeated parts and specialize them into things like the beetles have done. Beetles are incredibly successful and they've specialized those parts into horns and claws and wings and devices for shooting chemical weapons. And all this redundancy does is allow you to respond to many different types of problems because you don't know what problem is gonna show up. We think of redundancy as wasteful and inefficient, but if it was so inefficient and wasteful, why is it so common everywhere in nature? And the most successful companies use redundancy in all kinds of ways. Southwest Airlines uses simple redundancy. Early on, they found success with one type of Boeing aircraft. Now every aircraft in their fleet is that same thing, which means that every pilot knows how to fly every aircraft, every mechanic knows how to fix everyone, and every um, uh, stewardess knows how to serve every aircraft. And as a result, they turn planes much faster than any other airline. They also happen to be the most energy efficient airline. Uh, Geico use a different kind of redundancy. They use creative redundancy. Every ad agency will tell you, you gotta get one corporate brand and stick to that and, and have that image and that's it. Geico turned that idea on its head. It was a nothing 
insurance company coming out of bankruptcy. And what they did is they used like six or seven different ad campaigns at the same time. You had the cavemen that were put out because they said, Geico's so easy, even a caveman can do it. And you had the talking gecko, and you had this weird stack of money. I mean, they just tried everything and just threw it out there. And it was a creatively redundant way to get their name out there, and it was quite successful. More seriously, decentralized and redundant solutions always end up being faster, cheaper, and more effective than the centralized versions. They can happen spontaneously, like on 9-11, where a ton of people stranded in lower Manhattan, and you had boat owners all over the region saying, wait, I'm seeing all these people stuck down there. I got a boat. My buddy's got a boat. Let's go down there and get those people. No one ordered them to do this. They just thought of it. They saw and they responded. You had the largest, one of the largest, mass evacuations of people in history. And it all happened spontaneously through using redundant parts. Google also uses us as all the decentralized sensors of change. For example, their Google Flu Trends product tracks when you and I are looking for things on our own little computer saying, does my daughter have flu? What are flu symptoms? What are flu remedies? And when there are spikes and valleys in that, that actually tells you, compared to the CDC's data on flu, when there are flu outbreaks. There's one major difference between Google flu trends and the CDC's data. CDC sends out surveys to doctors and hospitals, gets them back, analyzes them, publishes them. Google gives you the same data two weeks earlier, which is a massive advantage uh, in a potential pandemic. Next, animals communicate to mitigate risk, and often they communicate in the language of their adversaries. A lot of prey species talk to their predators because predation is costly. And if I can tell the predator, I know you're there, you can't sneak up on me, it's probably not going to try to go after me. So it's a real low-cost way of avoiding a conflict. Um, there's some simple things like the coloration of this poisonous coral snake, but there's really complex things, even in a simple little animal like a ground squirrel. The ground squirrel, when it sees a coyote or a hawk, screams and says, I know you're there, coyote. I know you're there, hawk. Don't try to sneak up on me. But it doesn't scream when it sees a snake. Snakes don't hear. Screaming doesn't do you any good. Rather, it lifts up its tail and puffs it up and waves it around in a menacing way. And the snake says, I don't know if I want to eat that thing. But if, and only if, the snake is a rattlesnake, it also heats up its tail because rattlesnakes see in infrared. So it's sending a message to its adversary in the adversary's language, a lesson that we might learn better. Right after we killed Osama bin Laden, the CIA released videotapes of Osama in his house. And all the world's press, basically, all the Western press jumped on it exactly as the CIA wanted, saying, these videos demystify the bin Laden legend. We wanted to show how pathetic and frail this guy was. And that's what the press said these videos sh showed. But when militant Islamists saw these videos, they saw a completely different thing. They saw a man who was in hiding who kept his beard as a devout follower would, a man who was rich, who was living in humble conditions, and a man who was still praying, all this bobbing and stuff he was doing that we thought he was sort of crazy homeless guy kind of stuff was actually devotional prayer that any uh, 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 one in the Islamic world could see was a man being devout. So because we didn't think about how our adversaries received this information, we sent the exact opposite message. They didn't need to convince me that I didn't like this guy. I didn't need that lesson. They were trying to convince radicals that this wasn't a guy worth martyring, but they sent the exact opposite message. And that kind of identity that we see, especially in these conflicts, reminds us that when we see conflict with another group of humans, we tend to build up walls between them. But biology is a massively open access process. Every barrier in biology gets broken. The barriers between sea and land, between land and air, even the barriers between individuals and the group are constantly built and broken and built and broken again and again. They are broken because they need to be broken. 
to solve problems, you've got to break these barriers. So how this looks in nature is a process we call symbiosis. Every organism on Earth runs into the limits of its abilities to adapt, and when it does, it has to reach out to another organism in a process called symbiosis. Every organism has a partnership with many other organisms. Symbiosis is everywhere, and it occurs even between species that used to have an antagonistic relationship. Some partnerships are incredibly short-lived. Some are so long-lived that the species become inseparable. And symbiosis creates emergent properties, like when this little cleaner fish swims into the mouth of this larger fish and cleans its parasites. They not only have established a relationship, but that larger fish becomes much less aggressive to all the fish on that reef patch. That's something you wouldn't predict from just looking at these two species together. Here's an example of an odd symbiotic partnership, two organisms that have little to do with one another, Unilever, massive, conglomerated, international food service company, Ben & Jerry's, little tiny, homegrown, organic, environmental, ice cream company. But they both had a problem. Ben & Jerry's wanted to do good by sharing profits with all sorts of do-good organizations. But their sales had been flat for many, many years, and they weren't able to leverage as much good as they wanted to do. Unilever had a bunch of really boring brands and no really cool, funky, super premium ice creams. It took a while, but they eventually formed a partnership. And what's interesting is the partnership transformed Unilever as a company. It brought in this little, tiny unit that was a minuscule percentage of its sales, but it changed the whole way. When people at Unilever started to look at how Ben & Jerry's worked and how they treated their company and how they treated the environment, they said, we want to do that too. And Unilever has rebranded and reimagined itself in a way that's much closer to this tiny organism it took in than it was before the partnership. More seriously, humans make walls, but symbiosis can break through those walls. Um, my friend Terry Taylor in this picture, all I'll say about him, he was a member of these working groups I put together, is I looked at his, what he could share of his resume, and it looked awfully much like James Bond's resume. Very upstanding British gentleman. Um, but in his later career, he's been building these amazing partnerships, in this case between Israeli, Palestinian, and Jordanian health uh, administrators, doctors, nurses, who are all working together to identify and respond to infectious diseases, no matter what side of whatever border or whatever line on a map they occur on, because these people know that those things are gonna kill you way before the politics. Biology trumps politics. And remember I said, biology doesn't aim for perfection. These guys are not going for the perfect solution of peace in the Middle East. They are intently focused on the problem at hand, and that's why these partnerships work. And they work so well that Terry went on to develop similar partnerships in six countries around the Mekong River, or no less friendly to work towards one another, and now he's developing partnerships in southern Africa. And that leads to a last lesson of biology and adaptation, which is that you learn and repeat from your successes. The most adaptable organisms learn from success. And we hear a lot now, especially in the rah-rah management literature about learning from failure, and that sounds really good at first. It sounds like it's very self-effacing, own up to it, learn from your failures, that kind of thing. I've got no problem learning from stupid mistakes. When NASA sends up a space telescope and half of the engineers have used metric and half have used English measurements and the thing can't focus, that's a dumb mistake that you should learn from and not repeat. But if you really want to grow and adapt and evolve, you take a lesson from nature, which is that learning from failure in nature is a dead end. It means you didn't reproduce yourself and your lineage is done. There's nothing to build on. Learning from success is what every organism builds off of. Every living thing on the earth right now is an example of learning from the success of its ancestors. We focus a lot in our organizations on learning from failures. For example, Hurricane Katrina. Tons of things went wrong in the response to Hurricane Katrina. I've got no problem with learning from those things. But the Federal After Action Report for Katrina identified over 100 different failures and virtually no successes. And there were successes 
in the response to Katrina. One of those successes, which I only learned about by happenstance because I had a student who happened to be an active duty Coast Guard lieutenant and she was on some of these responses. One of the lessons from Katrina about what went right was that the Coast Guard cleaned up and contained a nine million gallon oil spill. Now when would it be useful to learn about cleaning oil in the Gulf of Mexico, oh right, the very next Gulf disaster, Deepwater Horizon. The one lesson you wanted to take away from Katrina was the one that no one had talked about. A missed opportunity to learn from your successes. So the question is, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. We're here, we're everywhere, we got ideas festivals, we got cars, we cover the earth. We're an incredibly adaptable organism, us humans. And that's absolutely true. And our adaptation has done amazing things for us, allowed us to live amazing lives. There are still a billion of us who struggle to get enough calories every day. So they're still right at that survival limit. But for many of us, all the things we've done as humans has released us from that daily struggle to survive. And that's overwhelmingly a good thing, but it does insulate ourselves somewhat from the process of adaptability. That's why I love to talk to soldiers and Marines who are just back from 10 years of fighting in Afghanistan and Iraq, because those men and women know how to adapt because they've had to adapt. And that's why I always say to every audience, you should be hiring veterans, not because it's a patriotic duty, but because these are the most adaptable people in our society right now, and they're wonderful to work with. So how do we start getting that sense of adapting and changing without having to be under fire, without having to be under the stressful conditions that most organisms are in in the world? And it starts with a very simple change. And that change is we switch from giving orders to issuing challenges. The difference is this. Giving orders is when one leader or a group of leaders says, we know what's best for you. Go do it. Issuing a challenge is when that same leader or group says, we're facing a big problem here. Who among you can help us solve this challenge? One of the earliest examples of this comes from the early 1700s in England, where they recognized that one of the biggest threats to navigation on the seas was that no one knew their longitude when they were at sea. And a lot of ships and a lot of treasure and a lot of lives went to the bottom of the sea because people couldn't exactly pinpoint where they were. And everyone thought the great astronomers at the time, the experts, would solve this problem. But English Parliament did a smart thing. Instead of giving a single source contract to an astronomer, they issued a challenge. And they said, anyone who can solve this problem will give you a big prize. And it turned out it wasn't an astronomer, but a watchmaker, a lowly watchmaker who was working on his own, figured out that if I make a chronometer that can keep very accurate at time at sea relative to the home port, sailors could calculate their longitude from that. We've since moved into a new era. It's almost the era of challenges. There are challenges popping up everywhere. And what challenges do is they activate all of those aspects of adaptable systems I've been talking about. When you issue a challenge, you get those decentralized observers of change saying, wait a second, I have a little angle on this challenge. You get redundant problem solvers, creatively redundant problem solvers all kinds of different people, like the watchmaker who came out of nowhere to solve this big problem. And they communicate among themselves and create symbiotic partnerships because when you go after a complex challenge, you run into your own limits and you say, oh my god, I could totally solve this challenge, but I need a programmer who can help me code this out. Or I need an expert in music who can help me understand harmonic scales, whatever it is, you start creating all sorts of amazing symbiotic partnerships. And if you're running the challenge correctly, you will identify those successes and figure out ways to iterate them because you don't just want to solve one challenge, you want to have the ability to solve challenges indefinitely into the future. So we're seeing this everywhere. Branches of the Department of Defense, a huge top-down bureaucracy, are finding ways to issue challenges. DARPA does this. They issue challenges and they tend to go not to the single source contractor that gives you the wrong product 20 years too late and $5 billion over budget, but to individual university engineering departments 
and they fight against one another to try to solve these challenges, like making a new robotic vehicle. DARPA gives the amazing prize money of one million dollars for these challenges. That's what I call couch change to the Department of Defense. They don't even know it's gone, and yet, and, and, and the university engineering departments probably spend more than a million dollars solving these challenges, but for them, the motivation is the pride of Stanford beating Carnegie Mellon or something like that. Businesses are starting to do this. 3M, 3M is not a company like Google or some high-flying adaptable startup. They don't have ping pong tables in the middle of the floor and you know, sushi everywhere, but <laughs> whatever they do, I, I'm mad at Google because I don't get that kind of treatment in my workplace. Um, <laughs> but 3M, uh, had a problem, which is that they wanted to reduce their environmental footprint. And they didn't have the CEO send out a memo to everyone and say, everyone recycle 20% more, go do it. Rather, they issued a challenge. They said, anyone in this company who can reduce our environmental footprint, give us your ideas. So you had administrative assistants over in one part of the company saying, oh, we could reduce paper waste by a whole bunch if they just let us do this. And you had chemists in a different part of the company saying, I was looking at how these labs are set up. We could reduce chemical waste by a ton if we just replumb this. You had over 8,000 different implemented ideas that saved the company millions of dollars, massively reduced its environmental footprint, and all people got for participating was like a certificate of achievement. Because when people believe in the mission of your organization, they will fall all over themselves to solve challenges of that organization if you give them the chance. And that's what I realized with my classes, my Department of Homeland Security classes. I went back to them and I re-examined them and I said, I've got to do something different with this organization because there is this massive spectrum of information out there and I've got all these amazing students in my classes. How can I activate them? And I realized there was one thing that was locking me in to this centralized organization. And that thing, in your business, it may be called something different. In school, it's called a syllabus. In business, it's called an agenda. But these are the pieces of paper that are the guardians of central control. So it's a great idea to rip them up. And that's what we do. In my classes now, on day one, all the students take out their syllabus, and I say, rip it up. We're done with that syllabus. Why do I have a syllabus to begin with? I have a syllabus because my dean requires me to have a syllabus. <laughs> and when you are an agent of change in nature, like a virus, a virus doesn't just go into your body. It covers itself in a protein coat, a cloak, which allows it to move in without the immune system getting word of it. And then it starts reproducing itself. And when it's successful, the cloak comes off and it's too late because that virus is there. That's what I do. I start these classes in a stealthy way, but I've been running them and evaluating them enough now to know that they're successful. So when my dean, as he inevitably will find out that I've been ripping up the syllabus because I've been talking about it in public, says, why are you ripping up the syllabus? I'll say, because my way works better. <laughs> and here's what it looks like. We rip up the syllabus, and I say, you guys took this class on environmental science, say. I can't teach you everything about it in a semester, so you tell me what you really want to learn within this topic. And I also want you to tell me what part of that you'd be willing or able to teach the rest of your students about. So every student gets a different class that they've identified that they want to teach about to lead the class. And we set up a course wiki site, like Wikipedia, and the lead student puts up their class topic and a few questions, maybe a few papers, just like I would have done, but then everyone responds to it. Everyone has to respond to it on the wiki by midnight, the night before class. And what it looks like, you won't be able to see the details, but what it looks like is a ton of information for every class that a student sends up. Every other student is responding, and they may be responding to something that a student posted at 2 o'clock that afternoon at midnight with some crazy idea they had while they were up with their dorm mates, and they're posting things from YouTube and papers that they had and articles and personal experiences. So when I come into my class, and what I'm going to show you are real data from a single class period, my classes look like this now. Students are gathering information from the whole universe of information, not just what I thought, that light blue box is the lead student. She's bringing in stuff from all over. All the other students are bringing in things from other students, from other classes, uh, from all sorts of information sources. And look at me, I'm the red box. I'm not doing anything. I'm sitting around and watching it happen. 
because decentralized classroom, it's more adaptable to new knowledge, it's easier to run, it's far more effective. The students love these classes. And here's the fun thing, it's impossible to predict. And this is the thing that scares most people off from taking that first step of going from orders to challenges, is that you do not know, just like in nature, what's gonna happen next. But I've done them enough now to know that what happens next is always amazing. For example, I mentioned that personal stories become very important to this process, which is something we usually forbid in classrooms. Well, I had one year, uh, a young woman who was gonna give a lesson on sharks and shark conservation. She had studied sharks one summer, and she was interested in sharing that. One of the big problems with shark conservation is that a lot of them get fished and killed. Their fins are cut off and their live bodies are thrown back, and the fins are used for a delicacy in Asia called shark fin soup. And I could tell that story to my students. I could even back it up with some statistics about how much shark fin soup we think is being sold. But in that particular year, I happened to have a Chinese student in my class, and his contribution to the wiki that day were wedding menus in Chinese. And in class, he explained them. And here's the thing, when people start putting up stuff, everyone wants to talk in class. And he was patiently waiting, and someone said, what were those wedding menus you put up? And he said, oh, let me tell you. I put up my friend's wedding menus, and my wedding menus, every wedding menu is the same in China. Except, look, there's one difference in my wedding menu. No shark fin soup. And let me tell you guys how completely difficult this was to have a wedding in Hong Kong without shark fin soup on the menu. And let me tell you the hell that my bride and I and our families went through not having this thing on the menu. The stories he told that were so poignant to his peers are something I could have never written into my own syllabus, never predicted would have come out in this class, but now the students understand this complete linkage from culture to global economy to those fishes in the sea. That class is never gonna happen again, and that's okay. It was the right class for that particular time. Next semester, I'll have a completely different amazing experience, but I can never predict what it's gonna be. And that leads to the last point here, or actually the last set of points, which is that adaptation creates what we call emergence, emergent properties, the things you wouldn't predict by putting one and one together the Chinese menu that comes out of nowhere, Unilever's transformation, the transformation of this large predatory fish into a pacifist, Southwest Airlines, because they've stuck with this same plane over and over again, starting from when they had three little airplanes in Texas and were fighting off the big boys, they are now the big boy and they can walk into a Boeing factory when the new version of this plane is being made and said, we don't like the door being there, move the door over there. We don't like that being there. Move that ramp lower. They have developed an emergent property with this much larger corporation because they stuck with an adaptable process. The goldfish are up there because my hero, Ed Ricketts, the one uh, university teacher he had, he never got a university degree, but he spent a few years at University of Chicago with a man named Warder Ali, who is an early ecologist who believed that the overwhelming force in nature was a cooperative force, and he did all sorts of experiments, including the simple one on goldfish, where he found that if you expose goldfish individually in bowls to a certain level of toxins, you can see how much toxins will kill them. But if you put those goldfish together and expose them to the relative same amount of a toxin, they don't die. They actually start producing this mucus layer that they don't do when they're individuals exposed to the same amount of toxin. That was an emergent property, a cooperative element of nature that Ali saw everywhere he went. And that's why people like Ali and his protege Ricketts and newer biologists who are moving away from that reductionist mode that we've been in for so long are recognizing that anywhere we can look at where the future is full of risk and unpredictable is a place where we can learn from the 3.5 billion year history of nature. And I have a lot more stories online on my Adaptable Solutions site and in the book, and I'm happy to talk to you today, tomorrow, and any time into the future. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Questions, go to the mic, please. So to start off, I mean, why, 
But as I read your book, I mean, one of the things that, and I, I have a, a keen interest in these kinds of ideas, is why don't we do a better job in our kind of formal education apparatus, whether it's high school or college, communicating these ideas outside of science? I mean, they're, they're dealt with in a very narrow bandwidth, and it seems to me that the implications of these and the influences go way beyond, obviously. Yeah, and I've been thinking about this a lot, and it's starting to break. The cracks are there. Um, out in the book uh, store, we have a book by E.O. Wilson called Consilience, where he really talked about this. And a lot of serious scientists, when that first came out, kind of laughed at him. But everything that he predicted would happen in that book about bringing fields together has been happening. And it's something I try to map in uh, my other book, Observation in Ecology, uh, which is that we went through a period in the 20th century. Remember that when Watson and Crick discovered the DNA molecule, uh, Crick reportedly runs into the pub and says, we've discovered the secret of life. And that mentality dominated biology, that if we just break it down to its smallest parts, we'd understand the whole, and it dominated biology for half a century, until very recently when we realized we cannot solve problems by looking at the smallest parts. And this is why early biologists like Ed Ricketts had friends like Joseph Campbell and John Steinbeck, huge thinkers, because they recognized there were complex problems back then, just like today, and they realized we've got to use all these tools to solve these problems. And I'm optimistic, and I'm already seeing that the doors are blowing open everywhere, and we're starting to see this very collaborative, interdisciplinary process. And, and obviously, sessions like this, programs like this, are a big part of it. Yep. Question. Hi, I'm a James Miller. I'm a, a teacher at DuPont Manual High School. And as a fellow educator, uh, I'm wondering about your system of assessing your students, because administrators, as I'm sure you know, are very interested in uh, reducing the educational experience to a number on a piece of paper. Yeah. So in a classroom like yours, in a decentralized classroom, how do you provide assessment of the student's learning both to the student uh, and also on paper for the benefit of your administrators? Yeah, so thank you. And, and evaluation is becoming this huge new thing. It's growing in the wrong direction. Almost every university in the country has been blackmailed by accreditors to say you have to have what are called student learning outcomes assessments. And I have to write these a year in advance about what I expect my students to learn. How am I gonna predict that I'm gonna have a Chinese student tell my students about the cultural impact of shark fin soup? It's ridiculous. But we are essentially required to do that. And again, I'm sorry to say, but it's the stealth mode. You find two manners of evaluations. I do the official evaluations that the school requires and the students hate. Um, it's the end of every class. You spend the last 15 minutes having them fill out bubbles. And I do a separate evaluation that's qualitative and quantitative that looks at this class in particular and how it works. And those I keep in my back pocket until the dean says, why are you ripping up your syllabus? And then I can break them out. And this is no different. This is a trick I learned from talking to young Marine captains who had come back from Iraq and Afghanistan. When they wanted to solve a problem, they didn't go up the chain of command. They did what they needed to do, and when it worked, they shared them on intranets and other ways with fellow captains, and, and they said, this is working, let's do this. And by the time the higher-ups saw what they were doing, they said, good job, soldier, glad you did that. But they didn't ask them first. So you actually have to be a little stealthy, and I'm sorry to you know, say that we have to be uh, uh, you know, almost illegal in our practices, but that's what you do. But you build from success. So if it doesn't work, you back it down, and you go back. You can always go back to that central place, get back in your cage. But you move it forward step by step. You build from one success to the next. You don't have to do it all at once. You could do two lectures in a semester like this, and then the next year three, and the next year four. Thanks. Question. Uh, yeah, my name is Jens Henneman. I teach computer science at uh, Kentucky State University. And yet, uh, as a matter of fact, yes, there are a lot of people actually flying under the radar doing that, a lot of my colleagues, myself included. So you're not alone. But, um, so, uh, but much with the point, um, Computer security is a fairly hot topic right now, and of course, the NSA story, uh, let's break in, that's a, that's a biggie right now. I'm not sure whether, when you put together your uh, uh, committee, whether you talk to Bruce Schneier at all, which is uh, one of the most um, distinguished computer security experts, but um, he's moved uh, away from a, again, also a centralized model, but also identified failures in security, not only as failures to adapt and especially assess risk and managing risk, but actually as a uh, failure to build and manage trust. 
Now, trust, however, is something that I postulate, and you may prove me wrong, hopefully, is uh, something that is not inherent in biological systems, because I tend to think of it as something uniquely human. And if that is so, um, can we learn any lessons from that, or are there any biological inspirations so, that bring us towards that? I would say, uh, you know, organisms can't call it trust and talk about trust, but there is a ton of inherent trust uh, in all biological systems. They have to trust one another to do what they want. And we've seen in experiments, if you violate that trust, for example, if you substitute um, inert argon for oxygen in the relationship between legume plants and their symbiotic bacteria, the bacteria will defect and say, you violated our trust. I, you were supposed to give me this nutrient and you didn't, uh, for nitrogen, I said, should say. So, um, so trust is inherent in all biological systems. We just happen to call it trust, which is why trust is fundamental in humans. It's, we know implicitly when trust has been violated. It's almost the first thing we know. Um, and, and some of my environmental work is on what we call the public trust doctrine, which is ripe for a comeback because it's the inherently easy to understand idea that a government only holds resources in trust for all of us. And we can see like Deepwater Horizon instantly that that trust has been violated because it's so deep in our evolutionary history. Um, and I have some work on the HBR blog, hbr.org, on cybersecurity that you can look up. Thanks. Question. Hello, I am Ching Ching Xiao, a senior at DuPont Manual High School, and I was wondering about the, you seem to be advocating for a removal of the hierarchy in classrooms and in social systems so that the authorities stand on even footing with the common people, and that seems to be helping, but that seems directly contradictory to evolution, which has shown that societies benefit from the structure. So are those two facts contradictory? And if so, how would you explain this change? Excellent Sorry. question, and uh, I gotta give a shout out for DuPont High School. You guys have come up with the best questions. It's so awesome to see you guys out here. Um, thank you to the teachers who brought you out here and, and recognize that you didn't just have to be in a classroom today. Um, it's a very good question. I have absolutely no issues with hierarchies. Hierarchy is very much a biological concept. Everything is nested within everything else. And everything I talk about and why I love the octopus is it's about a balance between that central control and that decentralized control. I like to say, have an open mind, but not so open your brain falls out. It's the same way with nature. You have to have, there's a very important role of controllers and leaders. That role can be identifying what the challenge is, providing resources to solve the challenge, keeping a broad view where maybe the local players can only see a small part of the bigger picture. So there's all these important roles. And that's why an octopus is so beautiful. It has this great brain, but it also has this ability to adapt really quickly. Thank you. Question, yes ma'am. My name is Jenny Wu and I'm a student at the University of Kentucky. I also wanted to ask you about your method of decentralizing the classroom. And it seems like from your description of it, you've added an electronic component where students will engage online before class and then also facilitating the classroom instead of lecturing. From my own personal experiences at my own university, I've noticed sometimes when teachers try to create those opportunities, students aren't too willing to jump in and take those risks. So a lot of times when we try to create discussion boards, students will wait until the last minute to do the minimum amount of posting and you can't really have a conversation before that. And then in class, they prefer the opportunities in the environments where they can text and be mentally absent instead of everyone engaging all together. So I was wondering if you had any particular techniques for countering that or if you've also experienced those kinds of challenges or other challenges in your new classroom. Yeah, that's a great question. And I found um, that um, it really helps that the students have completely drawn up the new syllabus themselves so they all have ownership of some part of the class so that even when they're not the lead student, they recognize a role which is that it's a community trust role. I've got to contribute to this class because if I don't, they're not going to contribute to my class down the road. In fact, I was really surprised the last time I ran a, a class of this nature, the student said, we don't like this posting just before midnight because I don't get to see everyone's posting. Can you have us do it two days before? And so we changed it and we went to two days before because they really like to react to the other students. So I think the missing component in your case may be that ownership component of the whole course. Thank you. 
Yes, sir. Okay, my name is Nick Koenig, and I go to DuPont Manual High School. Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> you talked about um, decentralized classrooms. Do you believe that it would work in high schools, and we should use this method of teaching? Why or why not? Thank you. It's a great question, something I thought about a lot and talked to uh, a lot of K-12 teachers about. And there's a perfect uh, analogous model in the uh, increasing interest in what's called problem-based or project-based learning. That's essentially a decentralized model. It doesn't have to look like my decentralized model, but project-based learning is about saying, here's the challenge, get in a group and solve it, and figure out who's going to have the skills to solve it. And that's when you start turning the shift from saying, Oh, that kid who we probably used to call a spaz, now we say it's ADHD, who doesn't contribute to the classroom model, actually is one of the best contributors to the whole thing because their brain works in a different way, not a damaged way. Um, and so, um, so when you unleash, again, that challenge, and there's lots of ways to do it, you unleash all the strengths and the successes of your classroom rather than speak to who has the weaknesses and who doesn't fit with the model. So it's very applicable to that level. Thank you. Uh, Rafe will be signing books out um, in the, in the um, bookstore in just a few minutes. Just our last event today before the reception, uh, Jason Ponton will be, will be in, a, in a half an hour. He's got an amazing panel of three people uh, from around the country working on some huge issues, including Kim Shu, who's on the Google Glass team. Uh, at Georgia Tech, and I think we're going to get some really interesting insights into what I think is going to be one of the big next disruptive innovations in the world. Uh, and so we'll uh, reconvene uh, in 30 minutes. Thank you. Thank you.